So this is our, our quick review. Um, your exam is on Thursday, so make sure that you have um, yourself prepared. Um, if you have any questions, please add them in the chat or um, interrupt me throughout, that's fine. But let's go through some of those key concepts. So you will have some key points from our physiology lectures, um, from our initial first two exams, but the bulk of the content will be on the application of what we've really talked about with uh, different adaptations, program design, and all of the kind of supplemental um, things that we need to worry about. So things like facilities, working with different populations, coaching, and so on. So first we'll talk about adaptation. Remember this is the change or the process of change that helps us change and improve to fit the environment. Um, training itself is our stimulus or it's our new environment that we put our athletes in so that they can be better suited for the environment of their sport. When we go through our um, said principle, they are specific adaptations to impose demands. This means that what we do or, or the stimulus that we give our athletes, so how we design our training sessions, our microcycles, mesocycles, macrocycles, those specific individual stimuli that we administer to our athletes will give a specific adaptation based on the demand that we give them. And so we as a strength and conditioning coach impose a demand or impose a stress or a training session or an exercise or an individual repetition to gain a very specific adaptation that is beneficial for their sport. If we go through our key adaptations, our key adaptations that we care about are skill, speed, power, strength, hypertrophy, and then our metabolic capacities, anaerobic capacity, and aerobic capacities. Um, think about those as power and capacity, or power as the maximum amount of work that you can do within that energy system, and capacity as the ability to repeat efforts or sustain efforts for longer periods of time. What I'm looking for in this exam is we're going to apply these individual adaptations to scenarios and how we would maybe train or change our program or things that we need to look at part of our needs when it comes to those athletes. So different skill or technique, different speed needs. So think about acceleration needs, um, maximal velocity needs, um, and how you may indicate that, hey, they're, they're lacking acceleration, they're lacking maximal velocity. What are those key indicators? Um, with power, we're looking at the force side and the, and the velocity side, so kind of the strength speed or the speed strength. So we're looking at both ends of that spectrum. Um, some sports require more on the velocity end or the speed strength end of the spectrum, some on the force end or the strength speed end of the spectrum. With strength, we're, we're trying to develop the maximum load or the maximum force that we can produce from those muscle groups within those movement patterns. So when do we know that strength is a limiter? What are the aspects of strength? Um, think about rate of force development, how fast we can create strength, maximal strength, things of those, those um, adaptations. Hypertrophy is strictly the increase in muscle fiber size or, or muscle cross-sectional area, muscle diameter. The muscle is getting larger. Hypertrophy allows for a greater expression of force. Hypertrophy is not strength. Hypertrophy is the foundation to be able to express a higher level of strength. Strength comes from the size of the muscle and the neurological skill to produce that force within the time frames that are necessary, especially within those sports. Um, with anaerobic capacity, we have anaerobic power or single effort power. This is the maximum you can work, the maximum. Think about anaerobic capacity as single efforts of maximal speed, maximal force, maximal power, and these, these major anaerobic adaptations for one bout, and then there is no kind of secondary effort. So think of closed activities like shot put, um, discus, javelin, especially those jumpers, um, we got high jump, pole vault, long jump. Those are really single effort activities. 100 meters is, is more of a capacity-based or an endurance-based anaerobic exercise. Um, think of endurance as the ability to sustain work. 
with anaerobic capacity, we're looking at lactate threshold or the ability, the maximum velocity or the maximum movement capabilities we have while within our aerobic capacity or within the aerobic system. So once we cross the lactate threshold, we begin to accumulate more lactate, we begin to rely more on the anaerobic systems. And then aerobic capacity for long duration, think of that as marathon runners or beyond, where we're, we're looking for longer durations, especially longer than um, somewhere around five minutes is kind of the shortest end where we're really working closer to lactate threshold, looking further out from about five minutes, so 10, 12, 30 minutes, an hour, are really working around that aerobic capacity for longer durations, working near lactate threshold. So where do these adaptations come from? Skill is primarily neurological. Okay, so that, that's our neural coordination, our motor programs, our ability to create those movements and coordinate those movements. Speed is primarily neurological. There are some muscular aspects or some, some connective tissue aspects with speed, but primarily it is neurological. It's your ability to create force and create movement in very short periods of time, which requires more neurological efficiency. With power, we work both ends of the spectrum. We work some neurological, especially for the higher rate of force development activities. And then also on the muscular capacity, if we have more capacity for strength from the muscular side, we have more chance to express it if we have also that neurological side. Strength itself, it's, it's predominantly muscular with the neural coordination. So we need that muscular capacity. So more hypertrophy, more muscle size, gives us the ability to express that strength or express that force capacity while using our neurological system to stimulate that. So if we have a lot of muscle, but we're unable to stimulate and coordinate that muscle, we lose the capacity for strength. So they're both incorporated there. And then hypertrophy is strictly a muscular adaptation. It's strictly the size of the muscle. So just because we have hypertrophy does not mean we have strength does not mean we have power, does not mean we have speed. It means we have a larger capacity to build more strength, build more power, build more speed. Okay, moving into kind of how we can change these adaptations. The force velocity curve is kind of our, our goal. We're, we're focusing around our ability to create force and how fast we can create that force. Um, our goal as strength and conditioning professionals is to really shift that curve to the right or increase the velocity or the, the rate at which we can create force. So if we're, we're looking more on this kind of closer to zero velocity, closer to maximal strength, think of this as isometric strength, which is where we can produce the most conscious force without having the resistance overcome us and become eccentric. Um, so think of that as isometric force, and it moves to further velocity. The more force we can create at a higher velocity means that we have more ability to express power, which is really what determines sport success. Power itself is really realized in this mid-range. Okay, so think of this kind of mid-range here, closer to the force aspect as strength speed or force dominant power, down here closer to the velocity end of the spectrum, this is more of the velocity based, velocity dominant power where there's still force. But as we can continue to move this to the right, we can create the same amount of force or greater amounts of force at higher velocities. Okay. Um, think of some examples of how this might be helpful. We can go through some examples after I go through all of this um, of how this could be helpful for sports. Make it specific to examples because I will give you examples in your exam. Um, when we look at how we can develop strength or things that we need to focus on within strength, strength is based on many different components of our movement. Um, so how many joints are involved? If we have more joints involved, we have more capacity to express strength. So we incorporate more muscle groups. We can change mechanical advantage, especially if we have more joints involved. So think of that comparing a leg extension to a squat. Um, the more muscle groups or the more joints, the more muscle groups, the more ability to create torque at those joints and create force on whatever we're trying to move. Postural position influences strength both neurologically and from the stable platform. So postural 
position if we're in that neutral posture in a, a normal neutral spine position. We have the most neurological efficiency. And from that postural position, we can transmit force through the torso more effectively. So especially with rotational based sports um, or contact based sports, if we have a very stiff and stable posture, we're able to express force better through our extremities. When it comes to range of motion, smaller ranges of motion often allow for greater force production because we don't, we don't become um, inhibited by changes in mechanical advantage from the load that we're trying to move. Um, so there's not greater torque at our joints, so we don't have to resist greater torque. We can better express force. Um, with muscle action, we know based on our force, um, muscle or force velocity curve through both muscle actions that eccentric force is we have more capacity to create force in an eccentric contraction compared to isometric or concentric greater capacity doesn't mean there is more force all the time but we have a greater capacity um, as we move into a higher velocity concentrically we lose the ability to express force because it takes time to develop cross bridges it takes time to take out the tension within our connective tissue. It takes time for us to send those neurological stimuli to the muscle to cause or initiate contraction. Um, but if we can kind of push that spectrum further as the strength and condition coach, we can benefit strength at all velocity points. Um, when it comes to how we create that force, peak force occurs, or peak force occurs near the isometric conditions if we're control or if we're creating that force um, rather than resisting some other force. So peak force is, is closer to zero velocity, which often is not what we're looking for in more dynamic sports because we don't have the time span required to create that peak force. Um, it takes closer to half a second to, to really create maximal contraction or longer. With rate of force development, this is how fast we can create that force. So how long it takes to create a certain amount of force. This is what's more important when it comes to field and court and more dynamic sports. Because the faster we can create force, the more power we can express. Because that force is being created now at a higher velocity because time has been shortened. Um, movement velocity itself, faster velocity movements have less capacity for force based on our neurological limitations and muscular limitations. And then how we incorporate the stretch shortening cycle. So think about things like jumping. Um, think of things where we have a rapid eccentric into concentric actions. So throwing, jumping, running, um, those are all kind of more stretch shortening cycle based activities where we have a rapid muscular stretch into a rapid concentric contraction. Um, moving past that, now we need to look at, we know what we, what we want or what's kind of required. Now we need to look more in depth into the sport. So this is your needs analysis. You went through it with your project. Um, this is where we assess the needs and the demands of the athlete within their sport and within their position. So based on different sports, understanding their metabolic requirements, strength requirements, power requirements, speed requirements, allow us to better create our training program to better create those adaptations long-term. Um, so remember, we go through our needs analysis, our systematic approach, looking at each individual component and what, based on that component, based on the sport, is required to be successful in the sport. Um, what is more important? What is least important? Um, what are those strengths and weaknesses? And then where we can create our program based on that needs analysis. So, Based on our needs analysis, we've created a, a kind of outline of what the sport requires physiologically and mechanically. Now we have to find a way to assess if our athletes have those capacities, where their strengths and weaknesses are, and to use these assessments to see if our training program has developed those physical capacities that we are trying to create. Uh, so these need to be necessary for the sport. Um, they don't have to be sport specific skills or actual sports required, but think physiological requirements within the sport. Um, and then find assessments that fit those needs that you're trying to train. 
really the keys here with these assessments are to find strengths and weaknesses within our needs and then to determine how our program is progressing our athletes. So we have our pre-test and we always have a post-test to determine what changed, what happened, and where we may need to create more change. If we find that we have many weaknesses in our first assessments, but our training plan has kind of bumped those weaknesses up, now you have new weaknesses, you may have to alter the training program to fit and change those weaknesses into less weaknesses or closer to strengths. All right, now we'll go a little review on program design. Um, this should probably be kind of fresh in your head as we went through our projects, but we need to focus on specificity. So metabolic strength, power, speed, mechanical um, specificity. It does not need to be movements that occur in the sport. They already do those in the sport. So we're trying to specifically develop physiological and mechanical adaptations that they cannot achieve within their sport. So not within sport practice. Then our key is progressive overload. So throughout our macro cycle or throughout our year, our training program, we have to continue to progress the athletes through either movement complexity, load, velocity, um, other requirements to create new adaptations. If an athlete stops progressing where you see that they've kind of plateaued in their adaptations, this is where we add new stimuli. So change the movement, change the load, change the volume, the intensity, the rest interval, all of our modifiable variables apply them as a way of progressing or increasing the difficulty of a movement pattern. Um, and then we add variation throughout our periodization. So those, those planned variation of stimuli fall into our overall periodization approach. So if we're doing the same exercises, the same movements for 12 months out of the year, we're likely not going to see very many improvements because there isn't enough variation to overcome the accommodation that our athletes will feel. So as we continue to stimulate them with new variations, variations can be changes in repetitions, changes in load, changes in movement velocity, changes in uh, how we apply the load to the body, putting it in front, putting it behind the body, using dumbbells to barbells. Those are all variations. It doesn't have to change everything completely, but variation and planned variation is necessary for long-term athletic development. So now we go through our program design lifestyle or life cycle, how we go through and plan our program. So we go through our needs analysis that we just talked about, create goals based on those needs. Based on those needs and goals, we program our variables or plan our modifiable variables. So the exercise choice, exercise order, frequency, um, exercise intensity, velocity or volume, the rest periods and how we progress all of those together, which lead to very specific adaptations based on those modifiable variables. Those adaptations hopefully contribute to performance, um, which could either be performance in an assessment or performance on the field, on the court, on the ice, on the track, wherever their performance is. And then we go back to our needs based on their performance, either in game or their performance in our assessments that we're giving to create a new needs analysis with new goals based on the new information that we have learned based on those performance assessments. Okay, with those modifiable variables, we have our seven, our primary six here should be seen in all of our training plans and the progression is our overall periodization model. Um, so that's how we plan to change these. Um, remember that exercises do not determine adaptations. They only determine the, or that's how we apply the exercise. So exercise choice is really based on where we want to create the adaptation within the body mechanically and how fast or how slow or what loading we require, what balance requirements. Um, so just because we do a squat does not mean that we get stronger in our lower extremity because doing a single leg squat is still a squat, um, but you're likely not able to load or move as quickly. So it may have other benefits, but they are specific to the application of the exercise. Um, when it comes to order, we remember we wanna do what matters most first, what's highest risk and what's most neurologically fatiguing. Um, so we wanna be safe, we wanna do what matters, um, and we want to get the highest 
ability out of or, or the highest performance out of the most taxing activities. So neurological fatigue comes from maximal strength, maximum power, maximum velocity, maximum skill or, or kind of high, high intensity skill. So we want to do those first because with neurological fatigue, we lose the ability to coordinate our motor units, to coordinate our muscle groups, um, to coordinate our movement patterns. So we want to do those first so that we can get those major movements out of the way, those real bang for your buck movements. Okay, after that, things like conditioning work, things like hypertrophy work, so metabolic and physiological adaptations like that, they don't require a more fresh neurological system. So you can perform hypertrophy or metabolic training in a neurologically fatigued state and still gain those adaptations because those adaptations are not based primarily on the neurological system like speed, strength, and power, and skill. Um, so we want to get those out of the way so that we can best perform in all of the exercises we choose to apply. Um, some key rules here with our exercise order. Uh, complex to simple, high RM to low RM, so high load to low load, high velocity to low velocity, unstable to stable, primary goal to secondary goal, and then strength, power, speed, before conditioning, and hypertrophy. Um, if I'm going to order those as, as kind of best order practice, speed first, or skill first, speed, power, strength, hypertrophy, conditioning. Um, I'll, I'll probably reorder how I create this, this visual so that it, it goes through that better linear path. Um, with frequency, this is how often we perform a movement pattern or train a muscle group. Um, so how many days you're training, how many times you're applying that same stimulus throughout a week, throughout a month, throughout a year. Um, when it comes to our intensity, intensity can be measured in multiple different ways. We'll often use percent one rep one RM, or if we're doing maximal velocity work, so think about sprinting or more speed and power work, maximum velocity. If we're doing more muscular endurance, um, so repeated effort or constant effort activities, maybe we'll use a maximum repetitions per load. This also kind of fits with um, hypertrophy training also. And then percent maximal effort or RPE, rate of perceived exertion. Uh, we also use this with reps in reserve um, so I couldn't do another rep. I could do maybe more weight, but less reps. I could do one more, two more, three more. Gives us a span of kind of how fatigued that athlete is after that individual set of training. Um, so how do we describe intensity or how do we prescribe it based on that continuum? Remember, we have our 1RM continuum here. The, the major focus for maximal strength is above 85%, which is about 5RM and above. Hypertrophy is, is best gained between about 60 to 85% uh, because that's where we can have the most mechanical tension with the most amount of number of, or the most amount of repetitions. Strength endurance is kind of along that spectrum. Think of that also as kind of muscular endurance. Um, strength endurance is your ability to repeatedly create force without rest. Um, so this is often like maximal repetitions per load, um, going near failure per set. Um, for volume, this is how we plan based on either sets and reps, number of repetitions based on the set, the exercise, the muscle group, the day, week, month, year, depending on how we are measuring volume. So set, that would be our inter-set volume. For the exercise, that would be our movement pattern volume muscle group if we're training, especially for hypertrophy, muscle group based volume. So how much volume is being applied to the quadriceps, to the calves, to the abdominals, to the shoulder? Um, how many repetitions per day, per week? So how many repetitions are you prescribing in your microcycle? How are you progressing those repetitions within the month and within the year? Um, for long-term athletic development, the best practice is to really up the number of repetitions every year over a, about a four year span and then kind of reset and continue to build off of there. Um, when it comes to repetitions based on the adaptation, this is very similar to our 1RM continuum when it comes to our adaptations. Five or less based on strength, power, and speed adaptations, that's about 85% and down for strength. Um, powers, power and speed are a little bit different, that's more maximal velocity. 
you can repeat 90% or higher maximal velocity within about five repetitions. Further than that, we begin to accumulate fatigue and that lowers the velocity of movement. With hypertrophy, we have kind of a, a nice range of about six to 12. This is a large range. We can also move and get hypertrophy in the, the further down the repetition spectrum into the strength spectrum. It's not a, it's not a hard and fast rule to, okay, with six repetitions, I'll get hypertrophy, but I won't get stronger. At five repetitions, I won't get hypertrophy, but I'll get stronger. That's not how it works. Um, it's really based on total volume and tension. So this is just kind of best practice when it comes to prescribing exercise volume. And with strength endurance, we need to do over 12 repetitions. We have to do more and more and more volume because the intensity is so low in order to gain those adaptations. When it comes to deciding our sets, um, this is best practice. This isn't um, hard and fast rules. Uh, but in, in most cases, if we're working strength, power, and speed, in order to create more volume on those adaptations, it's best to manipulate the sets rather than the reps because the sets allow us to have rest intervals. So if we're doing 10 sets of one, we can use a higher intensity than if we were doing two sets of five um, and so on. Uh, with hypertrophy, we can often get two to five sets is best to accumulate volume. And we need more than three sets for strength endurance if we're not doing at least three sets. Um, we're not really getting that benefit of the volume because the intensity is so low. Um, here I have kind of our volume-based intensity. This is kind of our, our 1RM continuum when we look at the load as a relative load or a percent one rep maximum and the repetitions available. Uh, so hopefully you looked at this through your project. This kind of gives you a guide to five repetitions is about 85%. 10 repetitions, about 74%. 12 repetitions, about 70%. Um, so, so that's kind of a general guideline throughout. If we look at kind of those goals, hypertrophy, 85 to 70, okay, maybe a little bit here. Hypertrophy gains get lower as we move down that, that spectrum. Strength is improved as we go above 85%. We don't get as much hypertrophy or as much strength in this mid-range zone. But we get a little bit of both. So for most athletics, this is kind of the general range that we would be in. With rest, we often don't think about rest, but this is really the critical key when it comes to modifying fatigue. So it allows for recovery either between sets, between repetitions, between training sessions, between exercises, between weeks, between months, within the year. So this is really how we can control fatigue to get the most performance in sport and the most performance while we're training. Um, so now if we go into our adaptations based on rest interval, it's best to rest three minutes or longer for these high neurologically fatiguing activities. Um, this allows for ATP PC reabsorption um, and resynthesis. And it allows us to really repeat those maximal efforts. The shorter rest intervals decrease our ability to repeat strength, repeat speed, repeat power. Uh, with hypertrophy, we need kind of a, a general rest interval. The lower the rest interval, the closer to the strength endurance end of the spectrum. Larger rest interval, will apply those closer to the strength end of the spectrum. So kind of mix those in with your volumes based on the rest required to repeat that effort. And then with strength endurance, we want to really minimize rest because we're focusing on accumulating fatigue and working under fatigued conditions. So how do we progress? Um, key star this one, you might need to have a question or you might have a question on, on progressing based on maybe someone is stagnant. Um, modify load, volume, complexity, and rest interval. These are, these are the keys to progression. So adding more load, adding more volume, load, or you could, you could also turn this as velocity also for intensity. So making it more on the speed end of the spectrum or on the load end of the spectrum, volume, the complexity of movement. So moving from maybe it's a um, clean from above your knee to a clean below the knee. That just adds some more complexity, more range of motion. It's a new movement, so we're changing movement variation. And then the rest interval. As we decrease the rest interval, we are working under more fatigued conditions. As we increase the rest interval, 
who are working under more fresh conditions, which may allow for other changes. So we, we should always work these progressions together to get the best out of our athlete based on the adaptation we want. Um, so how do we decide? Beginners, they adapt to everything. So really whatever variation you give them, as long as you're progressively overloading over time, they will get better. Um, as your training age goes up, the more variation may be required. So with a beginner, you may just be able to add load um, for a, a series of time, um, could even be a year, and that would be fine. But as the higher training age, they may need more volume to stimulate more adaptation, more complexity and movement to tax the nervous system from the skill end of the spectrum or the speed end of the spectrum um, based on our goal. All right, um, now we'll move into speed agility. Um, remember that we have different components of each of these. Um, so with speed, acceleration is the ability to change your body's position as fast as possible or, or rate of change in velocity. So speeding up, um, think of this as kind of start to max velocity or um, initial movements, change of direction movements really require acceleration. Maximal velocity is once we have achieved how fast we can move, it is the velocity we can achieve and maintain, especially over long term. The longer we can achieve that speed, the more speed endurance. Uh, but maximal velocity really is required at further distances, um, acceleration in very short distances, um, because it does take us about 30 yards to really achieve maximal velocity. With agility, we have different components. We have kind of strength components when it comes to coordination, stability, um, postural control limb control, and then deceleration strength or eccentric strength when it comes to those change of direction activities, the ability to create force quickly or rate of force production. And deceleration activities allows for faster um, reposition or reacceleration. With the mental components, we have planned and reaction. So planned is a set scenario that the athlete knows ahead of time. And then reaction, you are changing your movement based on a stimulus that you're seeing, hearing, or interacting with in your environment. Reaction-based agility or reaction-based change of direction is more specific to sport requirements. Um, you can do all the plan drills you want, but if you are unable to react and influence kind of that cognitive portion of agility, you're not going to excel within the sport. Um, quickness is really putting this all together, so having reaction, change of direction, and the ability to create force quickly or have rape or rapid rate of force development. Uh, with plyometrics, these um, I would recommend uh, starring this slide also. So this is the utilization of the stretch shortening cycle. So it's our ability to go from an eccentric to a concentric action um, as fast as possible or really minimize amortization time. Um, Reactive strength index is, is really how long you're in the ground compared to how long you're in the air. Amortization time is the time period it, it takes for you to change from eccentric to concentric. The faster the amortization time or, or the shorter amortization time, the more reactive that athlete is, which means they can change their position or change their movement faster and utilize the stretch running cycle better. Um, we can test if someone is very reactive by using maybe our squat jump and counter movement jump assessments. Um, the squat jump where you squat and pause limits the involvement of the stretch shortening cycle and looks at strictly concentric power. Um, but if we want to look at more stretch shortening cycle power or reactive power testing with a maybe a counter movement jump or a death jump gives us the ability to use the stretch shortening cycle. So if you jump just as high with a squat jump as you do with a counter movement jump. That means you have high concentric power, but very little stretch shortening cycle power. So you may want to work more on those plyometric activities. It requires speed, so, so rapid contractions, requires strength because there is a level of force that is required to absorb the body's motion and a level of force required to accelerate the body so that you can go against gravity and uh, jump or move or throw, whatever you're trying to do. Um, some of the warnings, um, plyometrics are safe as long as you have requisite strength. Um, they're the, the one thing that we really just have to pay attention to is total volume. 
um, and total load. So plyometric load, think of this as how fast the athlete is moving when they hit the ground, um, because that will indicate momentum that they have to stop. Um, and athletes with lower levels of strength and lower levels of training age require more physical development before you can really apply more plyometrics. Um, the higher volume of plyometric, the more risk for injury because they are such forceful, rapid contractions. If they are not developed yet, there is a higher risk for injury, especially as volume increases. Um, if we look at endurance, endurance comes in multiple ways. Um, so we have muscular endurance. So this is maintaining contractions or repeating contractions over a period of time without rest. So think of this as um, football linemen forcing against each other. Um, think of this as a rugby scrum. And it's times where you're continually producing force. It's not something like running where you are running, where you take a step, you have a force, and then there's a break. Um, that would be more on the power, plyometric, stretch shortening cycle strength end of the spectrum. Um, with intervals, we have aerobic endurance, which is more aerobic intervals are, are near lactate threshold and repeated. Um, so, so higher VO2 max based intervals, um, often longer in duration because the, the velocity of movement is lower than if we're using our anaerobic system. Anaerobic system requires a little bit more rest interval to repeat those higher intensity bouts. And long duration endurance is also no rest. So interval allows for rest muscular strength or muscular endurance and long duration endurance or long duration aerobic endurance, both do not incorporate rest intervals within their use. Um, fatigue comes from multiple pathways, neurological fatigue. Um, so think of this as more um, nerve conduction velocity. So having the fuel and the, the chemicals and the pH necessary to send maximal conduction, um, nerve conduction, for the muscle, we have energy substrates is kind of our main one. Um, when it comes to metabolic speed, the ability to create energy within that metabolic pathway and pH um, or the acidity within the muscle. Acidity lowers muscle and neurological output or causes fatigue. Um, fatigue within the blood is, is often the availability of substrates to create energy to transport to the muscle or um, through oxygen and CO2 content. Um, with oxygen content, it's especially required in buffering lactate and, and getting those hydrogen ions out of the body, especially if we're in the rest interval phase of anaerobic interval training. Um, and CO2 concentration are, causes more acidity within the blood, which lowers our ability to continue to work. Um, lactic acid, uh, which is the buildup of hydrogen ions that are attached to um, pyruvate, creating lactate, um, hydrogen ion buffering, uh, are all kind of mixed within that anaerobic capacity. Your ability to resist fatigue is your best, is your ability to really buffer this acidity, which comes also with higher capillary density. So if we have more capillaries, if we have more ability for blood flow or to slow blood flow within the muscle, there's more of a chance that we can get those acidity components or those acidic components into the blood and begin buffering and transporting them out of the body. Um, the liver causes fatigue or we can get fatigue from the liver because the liver stores glycogen and, and secretes glucose into the blood. Um, at higher duration, aerobic long duration activities, the liver can become glycogen depleted. Um, this is often occurs closer to the hour to two hour mark. So this is often not something that we see within most sports, except for maybe a marathon. Um, with fatigue at the heart level, this is often during aerobic exercise. Um, we're not gonna see fatigue from the heart in anaerobic activities. Um, so it's your stroke volume, your heart rate, and the ability for your blood vessels to conduct um, or, or transmit that blood throughout the body. Um, so that also falls into capillary density. With the lungs, uh, the ability to continually inspire oxygen and expire CO2, um, which really falls under inspiratory muscle fatigue. Um, our body should have the ability to really transmit those, especially at sea level. But as our inspiratory muscles fatigue, we lose the ability to inspire and expire as quickly as necessary 
um, to release CO2 or release acidity um, during aerobic metabolism. All right, um, now we'll go into some periodization, talk through here. So this is our planned variation of our modifiable variables. So remember, beginners adapt to everything. And then as we begin to overload the athlete in different ways with different variations, we can progress them long term. With our periodization approach or block periodization approach, we use a kind of an off-season, pre-season, in-season, post-season model or a four-block model um, where we build the athlete in off-season, specifically build them in pre-season, so general physical preparation, specific physical preparation, um, and then in-season we realize or we maintain those capabilities. So now we, we've developed the athlete, now we're using the athlete within the sport, and we're really just trying to stimulate those adaptations throughout that in-season period. Um, and then postseason we recover. So this postseason block is often very short, um, maybe around a month to, to uh, two weeks to often maybe four weeks, six weeks, where we're recovering, active recovery, and then we come back to the off-season phase. Um, with this block periodization, it is beneficial for long-term development. However, there, there are some limitations if we're developing like this. Um, because often some of those off-season gains that we have maybe in hypertrophy or endurance are often lost because we need them longer or further away from when we build them. So continuing to implant them throughout the training program can help us maintain those adaptations. Um, so that's the harder part is maintaining those adaptations with this block approach. Um, so the breakdown, you do need to know kind of what these are. Uh, Macrocycles are training cycles, so however long you plan that to be. Block is a piece based on a purpose or have, has a goal. Mesocycle is based along the block goal. Uh, microcycles are individual training weeks or one to two weeks. Um, so it's one really one cycle of exercises is your microcycle. And then the session is one individual training session within the microcycle. Uh, when it comes to your macrocycle, this is your entire training year or four years or season. Uh, it's your overall training plan from start to end. Uh, so this, this can vary in time based on the needs of the athlete within their sport. Uh, throughout that macro cycle, we really want to lower the volume really in the competition phase. Intensity can stay high because intensity does not cause as much fatigue as volume. Volume is really the determiner of fatigue. Um, and then as we taper both of those, we can allow a, a peaking. So especially in meat-based sports like track um, and combat sports, we can really peak performance in that very end of competition. This peaking it comes with super compensation or an increase in ability above your previous level. Um, it's because we allow for more recovery, limiting fatigue because fatigue masks our fitness as we limit fatigue, we're able to perform greater than we were before um, because that fatigue is gone. Um, so peaking is timing that, that super compensation. Tapering is how we plan or how we program to peak. Um, so it's rest to allow super compensation. And then overtraining is if we don't allow for that adequate recovery, it leads to fatigue and poor performance. Um, overtraining is difficult to cause, um, but if it does, it, it's often shown by more markers of fatigue and often means that they require a longer period of rest in order to come back to an even baseline if we overtrain too far. Um, if we go into some of the new stuff, some of the stuff that we really didn't cut to cover as, as a group in class, we need to know that flexibility is our range of motion or the available movement at a joint. Um, static range of motion is holding in one position. Dynamic is our ability to move it through. This is also active range of motion. So how we can move our joints, um, how much movement is available with our control. Static flexibility, uh, this can be passive. So this is really putting ourselves into end ranges of motion available at those joints dynamic or, or active or mobility, whatever you want to call it. Um, dynamic flexibility, active range of motion is the available range of motion that we have control of. So how much shoulder flexion you can achieve without an external load, how much 
knee flexion and hip flexion you can achieve. Um, those are really based on your active range of motion. Uh, star this slide, uh, what, what's really affecting your flexibility? Uh, joint structure, so how your joints are oriented. We're not all exactly the same. Age, um, as we age, we often lose flexibility. Sex, uh, because females often have more elastin within their connective tissue. They often have more range of motion. Uh, connective tissue, as we build connective tissue, as we, as we strengthen it, if we strengthen it within a range of motion, we often can achieve that range of motion. Muscle bulk does play a role. If we have too much muscle mass, especially in certain areas, we can limit the available range of motion at that joint because we have those two muscles or multiple muscles running into each other. So there's a physical block for that joint. Um, your activity level, the more physically active you are, the more range of motion you often have. And resistance training can improve range of motion in the range of motion that you train with resistance. Um, so if the body gains control within a range of motion, it will often keep that range of motion. If we have range of motion but lack control, the body often does not hold on or maintain that flexibility or range of motion adaptation. Um, when it comes to stretching, muscle spindles trigger the stretch reflex. Um, so you can start this slide too. Muscle spindles, they trigger the stretch reflex. So when the muscle spindle is stretched, and how fast it's stretched. So if it's stretched very violently, um, very forcefully and very fast, it will cause a reflex of contraction. That reflex of contraction will allow for force production, but it doesn't really allow for an increase in range of motion. With um, our GTOs or Golgi tendon organs, they cause reflexive relaxation. So as they are stimulated, they cause the muscle to relax in order to not cause as much tension on the muscle. So they're kind of tension receptors. Uh, autogenic inhibition is when we contract the agonist in order to um, then relax the agonist and gain more range of motion. So this is applying force against a resistance and then relaxing that muscle. That reflexive relaxation after contraction allows for greater range of motion. Reciprocal inhibition is contracting an agonist muscle in order to allow the antagonist muscle to, or to relax. So contracting the bicep in order to allow the tricep to relax and elongate so that we can add more range of motion. We often use this, especially at the lower extremity. So contracting the quadriceps while you're stretching your hamstrings, um, contracting the gluteus maximus while you're trying to stretch the hip flexor group um, causes reciprocal inhibition in order to cause more relaxation on the antagonist muscle or the muscle that is not being actively contracted. Um, so these inhibitions cause relaxation of muscles. Um, different types of stretching. Oh yeah, uh, star this slide, star this slide. Um, types of stretching. Static stretching is where we do not have ourselves contracting or ourselves creating force within that range of motion. Um, someone else or gravity is forcing us into that range of motion. Um, with a ballistic stretch, we're moving very quickly. Think of things like leg swings, arm swings. Um, these often trigger more muscle spindle activation and sensitivity, which doesn't really allow for greater range of motion, but it allows for nervous system efficiency. Where we can often, it's almost priming the nervous system to move the body more effectively. And then dynamic stretching, this is active range of motion stretching. So we're forcing ourselves into range of motion, contracting, controlling, and allowing us to have a more specific range of motion for what we're going to do, especially if it's a warm up procedure. Um, PNF stretching is a contract, relax form of stretching, which takes advantage of reciprocal inhibition. So contracting one group to relax the other, an autogenic inhibition by creating force with the muscle and causing a relaxation. So contract, relax, contract, contract the agonics, at, or contract the muscle, relax, allow a greater range of motion, contract the opposite muscle, allow greater range of motion. Um, you can manipulate it in many ways to get acute improvements in range of motion. Um, other ways, uh, self-myofascial release, which allows more relaxation of the muscle by creating tension at different points of the muscle. Um, so that, those more 
other alternative ways to increase range of motion, and it also increases blood flow, so it may help with recovery. Um, star these next two slides also. Uh, so this is talking with our medical staff. Indications are things that you should do. Contraindications are things you should not do. So an example would be, you can train the contralateral side. That's an indication, something you can do. Contraindication, do not do this. Okay, it's, it, kind of what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Um, stages of healing, star this slide also. Um, inflammation repair remodeling. So inflammation, we're really there to limit further damage. So in the inflammation stage, we're probably trying to have more recovery for the athlete. We're not trying to do more in an injured state. During repair, we want to add some stress, but only enough that, that really builds control uh, because that muscle will atrophy. We're not using it. But if we're able to create better motor patterns for when they return to our, or when they move on to the remodeling stage. So stopping guarding activities, allowing more control uh, can better the rate of remodeling because now they're not moving in compensated patterns. So this is really how we develop the athlete once they are no longer out of play or out of practice, this is where we can start progressing them. We just have to remember that when an athlete is coming back from an injury, they are not the same athlete they were before the injury. So they may think they are, you may think they are, but they are not. They are a new athlete with some new limitations, new strengths, new weaknesses, and you need to progress their program from a, a lower level than they were before the injury. They may not want to, but we do want to improve them we don't it doesn't matter what's happening right now it, what matters what happens long term um, when we move into some facilities management information um, we need supervision and we need to really think about all of these other environmental factors within our training space um, so safe storage of equipment not putting things in front of doors um, not allowing safe entry and exits um, having signs mirror heights wall movement remember our our barbell spacing barbells have to be spaced 36 inches apart um, in order to have adequate flow and safety within the weight room um, things like that equipment arrangement so how we place our equipment so barbells have to be 36 inches apart um, make sure that areas where people are laying on the ground like a stretching area is not near places where athletes are dropping weights um, like your weightlifting platform making sure that Everyone is safe and it, it flows well. Um, star this slide also um, with scheduling. Um, we want to make sure that we have a good staff to athlete ratio or coach to athlete ratio. Um, the younger and less experienced the athlete is, the smaller the ratio. So with middle school aged athletes, so think of age maybe 13 or 14 to 11 or 12, because this group is more developmental, and they also have lower attention spans, we want to have more supervision or, or less athletes per coach. So about a one to 10 ratio is optimal. Um, anything less is also beneficial, but more than that, it adds risk. With high school, one to 15, and the, the highest recommended limit is one to 50, which is not highly recommended. This is kind of, uh, if you're above one to 50, you are putting everyone and yourself in danger. Um, but these are our, our recommendations for these um, lower levels. Um, understand your program's goals and things that your program would like to do and what you're trying to achieve with your athletes. Um, so it may be athletic performance, it may be injury prevention, it could be nutritional education, it could move along overall education in exercise and exercise planning. Depending on your level, it may change your program goal. Um, so you may have different examples, like you want to create strength training programs, metabolic programs to benefit metabolic efficiency, educating athletes on different training. These are program goals. These are examples, um, but it really based on what you're trying to do. Uh, so goals need to fit with the department need for the athletes or the, the program needs from a sport side and from your strength and conditioning or athletic development side. 
um, star of this slide too, um, understanding youth and adolescence especially, I think this is one of your free response questions. Chronological age, biological age, and training age. Chronological age is how many years that the athlete has been alive. It's their, it's their age, look at their birth certificate, it's their age. Um, biological age is their developmental age or where they are in relation to puberty um, and the end of puberty or the start of puberty. Um, so how they're developing physiologically, hormonally. Um, biological age has a larger impact in these youth sports um, because you can have a 14 year old athlete or two 14 year old athletes. One has a, maybe their males, one has a full beard and the other looks like they could still be in sixth grade. Um, but they're the same chronological age, but you do need to train them with their, based on their biological age. The one who is more hormonally and physiologically developed will develop faster, especially when it comes to hypertrophy. Um, the one with less biological age may develop skill more quickly um, because their body hasn't changed much, um, but they're not going to be able to express strength and um, hypertrophy the same way and they need to understand that they are different and train them somewhat differently and have different expectations. Um, when it comes to training age, this is how long the athlete has been training or their experience with movement patterns, different settings, different types and styles of training. Um, some of the benefits when it comes to resistance training for youth, it adds to a more robust athlete. That's really our goal with resistance training is their ability to tolerate force. Sports will always apply more force than resistance training can. Um, but it adds to that safety. Um, it adds to general health when it comes to muscle health, cardiovascular health, connective tissue health, range of motion health. Um, all of these develop, develop on each other. Bone health, especially, especially for young female athletes, as we can build more bone mineral density at a younger age, they have a less of a likelihood of things like osteopenia and osteoporosis later in life. Um, and it adds some physical preparation for what they're planning to do. Most kids nowadays don't go out and play sports all the time. They're in very organized sports. They don't have kind of free play. So this is a way to develop them physically because they have to be in a more structured setting. Um, but the risks, if there is minimal supervision or not proper trained supervision, there is risk. If you have proper certified, educated supervision, there is minimal to no risk because the forces are much lower in sport compared to um, resistance training. And as a certified or a, uh, a knowledgeable professional in the field, um, like hopefully all of you will be, you understand progression and when to regress the athlete, when to progress the athlete. So you're not putting them in situations that could be harmful. Um, when it comes to older adults, a different population, what we're really looking for is an improvement in bone health, cardiovascular health, and muscular health, which all are improvements when it comes to resistance training. Um, so we can increase strength, power, size, body comp improve body composition, improve bone mineral density, improve function in activities through resistance training in older adults. So there are many, many benefits if it's administered by a trained, professional who understands progression and regression, which we've been, we've been going on over this throughout the semester. Uh, some guidelines. Um, the key one, make sure that they can handle the exercise, the regression, progression, and you're not overtaxing them because they cannot recover as quickly, um, especially if they are less trained. Uh, but make sure it's fun for them. Um, last thing we'll go over is coaching styles different types of coaching styles. So command style is very assertive, very dominant. It's very my way or the highway. Submissive coaching is very athlete centered and, and the coach is just there to um, be there. It's more of a supervisory role. There's more autonomy with the athletes, um, which can cause some issues when it comes to respect and understanding levels. Um, so if you're a more submissive coach, you do need to make sure that you can dip into the command style when necessary, when athletes start to um, blur the lines between athlete, coach, and turning it in more into peer, peer. Um, because as a coach, you are not the athlete's friend. 
you are their coach, you're there to develop them, you're not there to be their friend. We often see that in more submissive coaches and sometimes in more cooperative coaches. If they don't have hard and fast lines that the athlete is the athlete, the coach is the coach, they are not peers, they are not friends. There is a discrepancy when it comes to level of authority, especially within that setting. It is something you need to understand, they need to understand in order to have a healthy developmental training program. Um, cooperative coaching is my recommendation. This kind of mixes the command style when necessary, so be assertive, take control when necessary, but also have some real athlete interaction where they have some choice, they have some autonomy. You can often use a more command style in more youth athletes because they, they don't have um, the understanding or the skill in order to progress on their own or have that same kind of autonomy. Submissive coaches are often seen at, at more higher levels and cooperative coaches at higher levels also because the athlete does need to have a very specific training age. So at least a year to really start having them involved in developing the program because then they start to understand their body. They understand what they need, what they want. Um, so that's where you can be a little bit more cooperative if they have older training ages. Um, each has their positives, each has their negatives, um, and they all have their time for implementation, even within one session. You could be very command style when it comes to the warm up and make sure everything is very planned, and then you're more submissive or more cooperative when you um, create or give them the training plan and maybe you talk them through some exercises, maybe give them some modifications based on things they like or things they need or things that are feeling different. Um, so if they're more injured or they're more fatigued, you can maybe cooperate and, and change the, the training plan and more submissive throughout the training implementation because maybe they're more autonomous, they can handle it. So you can dip into all of these styles within one training session um, and you should be flexible within how you move and how you move between them um, within your sessions, within your weeks, within different athletes. Um, so those are very situation, sp situation specific. All right, now we'll uh, take some time to go over some questions. Um, and I'll pause the video right now. Um, the first one was with the youth and adolescents. So I know the chronolo chronological age, that's just in general how old you are. Um, bio, the, where it got kind of um, staticky was biological age and training age. Which one do you say is relative to puberty? Um, the, the biological age. So that's, that's how the athlete has developed physically um, based on, on hormone function. So um, where puberty is. So often female athletes will have a um, higher biological age for the same chronological age between males and females. Um, but that biological age really de determines when hypertrophy is available, especially in males, um, and when they can really express more higher levels of force production and power production. So chronological okay. um, age is, is physical age, um, and then or biological age, physical age, chronological age, um, time age, or years alive, or months alive. Um, yes. Training age is how long they've been in a training-based environment. Um, so doing, performing those types of exercises, training with that similar style, all falls into training age. Okay. Um Thank you. Um, my second question was for like the, actually for the final exam review on number nine, um, kind of describing that PNF stretching. Um, I, I know there was, you had a, a YouTube video on it. Um, uh -huh. I watched it a while ago. I just probably need to brush up on it, but um, yeah, I just got kind of confused on that. And I knew that was one of the quiz questions from the quizzes. Um, can you just kind of describe a little bit more on that PNF stretching and kind of how that does a lot more range of motion? Okay, so PNF stretching is called proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation stretching. Um, so this is taking advantage of the nervous system's ability to cause inhibition. So if we think back to here, I, I went over this a little bit here. Autogenic inhibition is where you contract a muscle and then relax that muscle. That relaxation after contraction 
causes a lower level of tonic muscle activity. So once you contract a muscle maximally, and then you relax, the muscle goes to a lower level of neurological excitation or kind of your tonic contraction. So your muscles are always somewhat contracted, but after you maximally contract, they relax further than they were before. If that muscle is more relaxed, we can create more range of motion because now that muscle is not fighting itself. It's, only, it's able to elongate. So that's the first part of PNF stretching. So um, I have an example here, kind of image. So someone would say passively stretch the hamstring through hip flexion. Then the athlete or the, the client or whoever you're working with will contract against that resistance. By contracting against that resistance, they are creating tension within the muscle and then they relax. That relaxation allows a greater passive stretch because now the muscle is less excited. Um, after that passive stretch, you can also take advantage of reciprocal inhibition by contracting the opposite side muscles. So in this case, if you're stretching the hamstrings, in this way you could contract the quadriceps and the hip flexors, which would create a greater relaxation in the hamstring muscles. So you can allow a greater passive stretch because you're really tricking the neurological system into relaxing further than it would before. Um, so that's why there's no real long-term change from PNF stretching. Um, you get a acute change for somewhere around an hour to three hours where you have more range of motion. But after that, the neurological system kind of goes back after you cool down, um, you relax, you stop moving for a little bit, you go back to where you were before. Uh, so it doesn't have really long-term change. It's more of an acute range of motion change, so not chronic. You would need to do higher volume static and dynamic stretching to see greater long-term benefits from stretching when it comes to range of motion changes. Did that make sense? Yeah, and um, kind of on the same topic, um, kind of related with the stretching, um, I was kind of just looking up just other YouTube stuff and kind of in regard to like stretching and movement patterns and all that stuff. And um, specifically, I forgot who it was that I was looking at that was mentioning something about um, kind of like the pros and the cons of the warm ups, especially like if you're a weightlifter, that if you're warming up, let's say with a static stretch or dynamic. Um, I, gosh, I wish I could remember specifically what it said, but it was along the line of you're starting to create a different movement pattern. Whereas like when you're more stiff, obviously before you warm up and you go straight into the, under the barbell, um, you just, it's just a different movement pattern overall. Um, I guess just my overall question is, oh gosh, yeah, I, I got to go back to that to really ask it again. I thought I had that question prepared. Yeah. If you, if you found it somewhere, you can, you can shoot over the link. I'm, I'm happy to look at it. Um, but with warm-ups and flexibility, you're, you're warming up to increase muscle temperature, increase heart rate, cause some perspiration so that you're, you're creating a better environment for your muscles to contract optimally. And then by adding more range of motion specific drills like dynamic and active flexibility, you expose your body to the range of motion that's required prior to using it. So it is more efficient at using that movement pattern when you are training or actively um, either training or competing. Um, when it comes to static stretching, because static stretching causes more relaxation, it often lessens the, the nervous system activity or it kind of slows your nervous system down. Um, your muscle spindles are less active, less excitable at the same speed. So it slows down speed and force production, but you can do active range of motion after static and it will kind of negate a lot of those negatives um, because that active range of motion causes you to cause control or neurological control within the muscle so you're contracting you're stabilizing it puts the body back into kind of normal um, so doing a long stretch right before something heavy or fast not beneficial um, the research says it's it's not beneficial for force production but in reality you want to expose your body to ranges of motion that are required for the sport and the training session. That's the flexibility that's required. If you have more flexibility and you can't control that flexibility, it becomes a liability. Um, so range of motion without control 
is a risk. Uh, but range of motion with control can be beneficial as long as that range of motion is necessary for the sport. So I kind of went off on that, but that's, that's not really related to this, but that's kind of further, further detail. Um, what other questions do we have? We can go through some pieces. I think my, I think I went through most of these um, within that little review lecture. I'll also post those slides up too um, after this. Um, um, so I think about 15 and on are based on things that we, we did before or based on labs. Um, so muscle fiber types for performance on different types of sports. Remember, uh, type one fibers are, are oxidative fibers. They're more slow twitch, better for long duration activities. Type two A are more um, fast twitch, but also a little bit, they're more, um, more think of those as kind of your anaerobic power fibers. Uh, and then type two X, think of those as our max force, max velocity fibers. Um, fuel source for each type of metabolism. So think about carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Carbohydrates can be used in anaerobic and aerobic metabolism. Fats and proteins can only be used in aerobic metabolism. So that's a key there. Um, which hormones can contribute to tissue growth? So go back to that lecture, look through those. Things like testosterone, um, insulin-like growth factor, uh, growth hormone um, are our primary really growth tissue growth rather than breakdown. Um, breakdown, think of those as um, progesterone, cortisol. Um, those are our major breakdown or catabolic hormones. Um, describe each type of lever. So go back to levers one, two, or le lever class one, two, and three. First class lever, think of it as the teeter-totter. Type two is our wheelbarrow. Type three, uh, Think of that as like our pulley, especially within our muscle groups within our body. Um, default, the body has type three or third class levers uh, for most cases, except for uh, elbow extension and cervical extension are some of the major type one levers. Size principle, remember type one fibers are recruited first preferentially into larger uh, motor unit pools. So the smaller, the more slow twitch, the earlier they are uh, recruited because they're more efficient, we're more likely to use more efficient muscle groups first. But once we require greater levels of force, our body dips into larger motor unit pools, type 2A, type 2X, and so on. Uh, benefits and drawbacks, so you, we went through all of those. Uh, macronutrient recommendations, so back to what's our protein requirement, so one gram per pound or 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight for protein. Um, that's the major one that we need to remember. Um, exercise techniques for weightlifting movements. So that's based on your lab uh, nine on weightlifting movements. So what's the first pull? What's the second pull? Safety. Um, and then exercise techniques. So your lab practical should prepare you for any questions there. Um, so what do we do during a squat? What do we do during a bench press, a deadlift, a lunge, a pull-up, things like that? Uh, so what further questions do you guys have? Um, I tried to get as much in the review as possible so it wasn't kind of sitting on questions. Yeah, I have one. Go ahead. Um, on 15, the one, um, I don't know if you can remember, on exam one, you told us which muscle fiber type, and it was, it can either be um, fat type 2A or type 2X, but I forgot what was the question. It was like, I think in 800 or, or something to do with running. Um. So, so type one fibers are, are more beneficial for more aerobic metabolism based exercises or anaerobic metabolism based activities. Uh, so if you want to use a running example, type one fibers will be better for things like 
five K or one mile, two mile, three miles and up. Um, type one and type two A would be more beneficial for those middle distance. So things like also the mile, the 800. Um, but when we move into things like the 400, type two A are more dominant. And as we move closer to the 100, type two X would be um, more beneficial. Um, when it comes to performance in those durations of activities. So longer duration, more type one involvement. Shorter durations, type two involvement. Um, so kind of line those up with metabolic needs. Thank you. So we've got a little bit more time. Looks like we had a lot of people drop out. Um, we have questions on exam format. Um, it's 40 questions with two free response. You already have the free response. Um, you'll have the full final exam time, the standard time for your exam. So I think it's two and a half hours. It'll be available the entire day. Uh, what else? I'll be posting up your grades for your projects um, today. Christian, do you have a question? Francisco? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh go, ahead. go ahead, Francisco. Oh, I just had a question about the final. Um, it's still Thursday, right? Because I know some people's finals have been moved around. Uh, I will. I would not move the final from what's on the syllabus um, because that's that's my con contract with you on on times. So it's just available the entire day rather than that only that time period. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Christian. You had a question? Yeah, on the lab practical. Um, there's a submission portal, right? Or do we submit that in? There, there should be a submit submission that? portal. Okay. Um, let me look. I have a blackboard open over here. Uh, for strength and conditioning, we have, yeah, the submission portal, I think it's like the third, fourth one down. So it's up there. If for some reason it doesn't work, email is fine. I'm not going to worry through those. I do recommend doing the lab practical before the exam. Any more questions? All right, um, I recommend going through the study guide again on your own if you wanna review this video also. I know I went kind of fast, but it's recorded, so you can kind of go slow if you wanna watch through it again. Um, I do wanna say thank you for a great class, even though it went to a different format. Um, I really enjoyed working with you guys, um, all of you, and I hope that you all are very successful in your future. I know a lot of you are graduating, um, so if you ever need assistance outside of school now, once you're, once you're gone, if you ever want to reach out, um, I'm happy to help if, if I can. Um, thank you all for a great semester and good luck on your final exam.